song service was going on, we had the old school vibe going. I remember as a new convert, we used to sing, Bless That Wonderful Name of Jesus. Wonderful chorus, but the song leader always would explain why we bless the name after in the verses. He would go, now power in the name of Jesus. He would follow that with now victory in the name of Jesus. Or there's healing in the name of Jesus. Or better yet, there's salvation in the name of Jesus. So every time I come to church, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Because I want that power in my life. Humanity, we take out. 
In Western Europe, we find the wolves have been nearly wiped out. In most of Asia and Southern Europe, the lions are gone. Wolves in North America are almost gone except for a small region in the Northwest. In thylacines, the dominant apex predator of Australia has been wiped out for nearly 120 years. Humanity recognizes something pretty quick when they come on the scene. All right. They find that if there is a large threat, if there is an animal that is powerful enough to take them out, that they must be dealt with. Yeah. It's the idea that if we kill the threat before it pursues us, it will give us a safer tomorrow. Right. If you have a bear today in your yard, he will have your child in his yard tomorrow. Right. We find this concept is very applicable to the life of a Christian. It's really, it's really remarkable when we realize that when humanity comes on the scene, they take out the next biggest dog next to them. Right. The apex predator in the day. How safe would Columbus be if we had mountain lions and we had bears running around in our backyard? It's a nerve-wracking experience. We take them out. Uh -huh. But at some point, in most all civilization, we do the reverse effect. Right. We want to introduce the black bears back. Right. We want to introduce the wolves back. We want to bring the mountain lions back to their native range. But we fail to realize they were taken out for a reason. Right. We find in the scripture, in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, Saul is given a decree by God. Yeah. He said, there is a people that I want you to annihilate from the face of the earth. Yeah, right. There is a group of people that I don't want a man, a woman, or a child left. He said, I want, I want this people gone. All of the oxen, all of the livestock, yeah. every sight of this people I want off the face of the earth. And Saul, he does almost that. Right. He keeps the king of the people by the name of Agag. Yeah. And he keeps some of the best livestock for sacrifice and good things. This, this king, he then affects his kingdom. His decision, the fear of the people, ultimately leads to his downfall as king. But the effects of his decision to not wipe out the predator of the day affects the people of God nearly a hundred years later. Right. In Esther chapter 3, we find a man by the name of Haman. Right. He is a descendant of that Ahab. Right. If you ever read the book of Esther, the story is, is a big plot. By this man Haman. He's the chief advisor to the king. And he notices the new queen's father. Her adopted father. Doesn't bow in recognition to the king. And it starts a snowball effect. Where he pushes and promotes. The genocide of God's people. Right. See this principle is an effect for us. That if you don't handle what you're supposed to. It will always come back. To bite you in the end. Right. There are things in your walk with God, and I can remember this as a new convert. There are things that you gotta get out of your life so they don't come back and get you in the end. Hallelujah. There are parts of Egypt that should have stayed on the other side of the Red Sea, and you should have walked toward Canaan with the destruction of the sin in your life just fine. There's some reasons why we take out the enemy in our land. All right. There's some reasons why we take out the predators that are coming for us. Right. Because we want a peaceful walk moving forward. All right. Amen. There's some reason. Hallelujah. And the biggest reason why a, a large predator is taken out is for the safety of the people. That's right. It does have inverse effects, though. It does. We find that any time a large predator is taken out, the prey of the area increases. Yeah. Uh, in Indianapolis, we see this in Eden Creek Park. They've had to instrument and, and put in hunters in the area because since we have no natural predators to keep our deer population down, humanity has to come in with guns once a year at a certain time with real big rules to win Indy. You see, the thylacine was taken out of Australia. It was the apex predator nearly 100 years ago. It was taken out because of competition from wild dogs and other animals. 
But when the big predator was taken out, the rabbit population skyrocketed. All the other marsupials in the area, they doubled in size. And the people of the area, they couldn't keep up because when the big dog is out, the prey go up. Yeah. It's the concept that your mom used to say, when the cats are away, the mice will play. Right. There's no cat in that farmhouse. Right. The mice got a free one. All right. This, this principle leads us to, to see this. In our lives as Christians, most of us all have overcome something massive in our lives. Sure. Right. Yeah. Some of us have overcome addiction. Some have overcome the troubled childhood or uh, depression. Or, or you, You've had some milestone of faith in your life. You've got a pillar. You've got this one thing that you cling to. We call it a testimony. You've got this thing that you walk around with that when you witness to the guy at Walmart, it's your go-to. You pull it out of the wallet and say, bro, I was this, but now I'm this. Right. right. We all have that moment in our life, that awesome experience with God. We have the moment in which we took out the apex predator in our life. All right. We have that, that obstacle that weighed us down. It kept us back, and we took it out. But sometimes when you take out the big problem in your life, yeah. when you take out the big issue that plagues you, when you finally overcome this sin that has had you bound for years, it gets you in a space just like that. Yeah. It's a space called complacency. Wow. All right. In Psalms chapter number six, the psalmist calls this place that of a slug. He tells the slugger to look towards the ant that works hard and diligent to prepare its meat for the sun. Uh, this, this place of complacency is normal for folks. Yeah. We overcome our big obstacle and now we've made it. Right. We've overcome the problems in our lives and we in the church house on Sunday. Right. This is where that complacency comes in. It, it overwhelms us. It's, it's that, that notion that I've made. Uh -huh. I found in John chapter 5, there was a guy who had a similar experience. There's a pool in John chapter 5 called the Pool of Bethesda. Yeah. There's a man who has been sitting by this Pool of Bethesda for 38 years. He's sitting by it because there's some awesome that happens in this pool every single year. Right. Once a year, there's an angel that comes by and troubles the water. And when the water is troubled, the first person that gets into the water is healed of whatever infirmity or sickness they have. Right. Whether it be impotence, whether it be a withered hand, whether it be uh, being blind or deaf or, or that of palsy, they're healed of whatever it is. Right. And when the man who sits there for 38 years, he watches everybody else get the blessing. We've heard something preached like that. Don't watch everybody else get your blessing, get in there and get it. And we've heard that, but I want to take this, this different approach. When the man has a conversation with Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene with him. And he says, will thou be made whole? And he says, back to Jesus, when the water's trouble, have no man to dip in. But what's so remarkable is, he saw the blessing in the water. He said, that when the water's trouble, have no man to dip in. I'm around a miraculous healing. I've been around the power of God for 38 years. He has seen 38 people healed. Most of us in this room haven't seen 38 people healed year after year after year. All right. He has seen the miraculous power of God for years. He had been comfortable just being around the power of God. But he had made no effort to secure people to help him get his own blessing. Right. He, he was comfortable being impotent and near the water. He was comfortable just being at church. All right. He's comfortable when the song service goes and we begin to sing the songs of Zion. Right. It's awesome that I see Sister Carrie get her blessing. It's wonderful to see Brother Roman get his blessing. But I just can't get to the water when the blessing time comes. I just can't quite get there. All right. I, I love to hang out here because I know there's always a chance that I'll get my healing, but when the water's trouble, I ain't got nobody to put me in the water. All right. And this is this is that.
that exact thing that they taught in the epistles. This is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It is very important as a Christian, we don't get to the place where we say, I believe in healing. I believe that God can heal cancer. I believe God can touch your body. I believe that God can do all these things, but you never have the faith to move forward and lay hands yourself. I believe God can eradicate addiction in lives. I believe he, he can catch the, the bottle out of the alcoholic's hand. But when I got a problem, I come to the pool of Bethesda and I'm just waiting for the pool to be touched and hoping somebody drags me in. All right. Oh, I come to preach to somebody right. today. It's very much important that as a saint of God, you realize that any blessing that comes in your life right. is going to come from you getting up and taking right. action yourself. Right. Amen. If you ever want forgiveness of your sins, you got to go to the altar and repent. If you ever want your sins to wash away in the name of Jesus, you got to go to the preacher and say, I've got to go back. If you ever want to heal, you got to go to Paul and say, I'm not going to go. If you ever want your marriage strengthened or a blessing in your life, you got to get to pray for it. It's 
sneaks up on them. Amen. So when we're preaching, sometimes we're trying to inspire the elders in the church. You just hold on. The race is almost over. It's there. But we, we preach this call to action. And in the scripture, we, we see this call at the heart of some of the most powerful stories we preach. Some of the most powerful parables we bring out have caused them. Well, actually, even when we teach in our Sunday school class, this just came to me. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse number 4, we say, Hear, O Israel. Oh, yeah. We don't tell our kids this. We just want them to get the latter part. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We want them to understand that God is one God. The same the Jehovah of the old is the Jesus of the new. I can keep going and get some amen, but we won't let it go. But here, we want you to listen. It's a call. Right. Open your ears and listen to my declaration. Right, right. And that's half the, the catchphrases that preachers have are those filler words. Is, Come on, somebody. I wish I had a witness. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you should, you should hear this preacher today. Amen. Amen. Everybody under the sound of my voice. Yeah. What are those? Those are calls to action. Say to the church, would you listen to the preacher? All right, all right. So they are. The call to action. And we find in the scripture, this is where I really want to get to right here, is... Preach to us. Oh, well, I want to. I want to. I'm excited about it. All right. We find the term, rise up. Yes. It's used 67 times in the scripture. All right. The terminology, rose up, is over another hundred. The word, arise, is used over 60 times as well. This is a theme in Jesus's teaching and something he gives unto the disciples as they spread his message. Uh -huh. In Luke chapter number 5, we know the story about the man who gets let down through the roof. Everybody done heard a young preacher preach hot about the man who gets let down through the roof. They come up, they tear some chills off, he's on, a, he's on a mattress, they let him down, he's on a ceiling mattress, all his boys are there, he gets touched by God. But it's so it's so remarkable when you hear what he says. Jesus, he comes to the man who's been let down through the roof, and he says this, I say unto thee, arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. In Luke chapter number 6, the very next chapter, he's dealing with a man with a withered hand. He, initially, he comes to his brother, and he forgets his sins. Yeah. And the Pharisees are there, they're all on him that day, they said, what happened? Kind of guy is this? Forgive his sins. He, he says to him this. Is it easier to forgive sins and say that? Or is it easier to say rise up and, and go? And he says this to the man with the withered hand. He said rise up and stand forth in the midst. He later tells that man to stretch forth thy hand. And John chapter 5, that man the pool of Bethesda I just talked about. When he came on to the man and he complains and says look. I don't have anybody to put me in the water. He says this, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Uh-huh. And Acts chapter 3, at the man at the gate called Beautiful, he's right. asking for money. Peter says, silver and gold have I enough. Right. I ain't got any money for you, but this is what you should do. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up oh, and walk. Right. And immediately. All and right. that man is made whole. That's an action right there. Right. What, I, what I want you to know today yeah. that nothing will happen in your life unless the action takes place. All right. All right. Most folks that they're, they're listen to all these stories I just mentioned, these four back to back to back. The man comes from the roof, Jesus tells him to rise. Was the healing occurred when Jesus said rise? No. The healing took place when the man got up. The man at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Did the healing happen when Jesus said, rise? No, it took place when he got up. Right, right, amen. The man with the wooden hand, I'm trying to let you know this. When, when, when he comes forward with his wooden hand, and he says, rise, and come on with it. And he says, stretch out your hand. Jesus pulls him up. It didn't take place when Jesus said, rise. It took place when the man stretched forth his hand in faith for something. And right. the man and the being called beautiful, he said, silver and gold, how do I know? I ain't got no money for you, but stand up in the name of Jesus. He pulled him right up, and his feet took place, and he knew for him. I want you to know, as a church body, you can 
have found this concept that if they can gang up on one big line, right. one strong line, that eventually the line will get frustrated with fighting all these dogs all the time. So the lions will begin to kill in surplus. What they'll do is, they'll not only kill an Apollo for them, but they'll kill an Apollo for them and one for the pack of wild dogs. And this is a common practice in areas like Zimbabwe on these nature reserves. These lions have determined it is so much easier for me to just kill it up for everybody than to have to fight these guys every time I get my kill. Right. But what they found is when that large lion, when that big monstrous beast, that king of the jungle passes away, those wild dogs then take the opportunity to be the big dogs of the area. The thing that had been supplying them goes away. And in natural, you would assume that they would begin to struggle, but they begin to flourish. Because what happens is we have this, this assumption, and sometimes this happens even in our, in our churches. I heard this the other day, and it is it's somewhat true. Um, in, re in regards to somebody like Vesta Main, they say that she's so powerful in prayer. When she goes, I have nobody to fill her place. We won't. And, and that's fair. She's a, she's a lion of the faith. But the scripture tells us a living dog is better than a dead lion. Yeah. Because a living dog has life. Yeah. Right. That's it. And when there's breath, there's hope. Right. When there's life, there's opportunity. Yes. That lion may have dominated the terrain in Zimbabwe, but the moment it's off the scene, right. that dog that couldn't compete, mm -hmm. that dog that didn't have it, yeah. that dog that was too small right. to kill the prey, right. that dog that was told it wasn't good enough for a long time, yeah. Yeah. that dog that got beat up by the lions all the time, always got beat to that next meal, and we can just take this in a spiritual application. That line that's been doing all the work at the church. Right. That line that's been praying the folks through. The line that's been, been witnessing the souls and teaching in our Sunday school classes. When that line moves off the scene, it's time for the dogs to step up. Right. It's time for those that have been discouraged. Right. It's time for those that have been underappreciated. All right. It's All time right. for those that have, that have had hurt in their life. It's time for those that don't feel good enough. All right. It's time for you to realize it's your call to action. All Amen. Right. Yeah. All right. The lion is gone. The big thing in your life is gone. And it's time to move forward. Right. All right. It's time to move forward. I'm talking to a predominantly safe crowd today. You guys are blood bought. Amen. Uh, you, you, you the holy rose. You All the right. fruit. Yeah. You the same folks in the church. It's time for us to set forth. Right. right, right. We've seen our healings. Right. We've seen our blessings. Right. God's come on a scene in our life. Yes. He's touched us. Yes. We've seen the power of Pentecost. The move of God has touched our lives. Hallelujah. Some of us have been delivered. Some of us have been brought out of some bar we could. Some of us uh, have a back background, but God's grace has been sufficient. Right, right. Amen. Uh, God's goodness has run after you and yes. you, and you see his blessing. Right. Some have come from the drug house to the church house. Right. Some have come from poverty and now all the riches in the churches of the kingdom of God. Amen. Some of us have seen his blessing and yes. his blessing, but along the way, we've got comfortable with receiving our blessing from life. Somewhere along the way, we've been comfortable with receiving our sustenance, our healings, our blessings off the backs of somebody else. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, at some point, though, it's time. It's time. It's time for you to step up. It's time for you to come on. So long as stand across now, Sister Ray, would you come on? Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. hallelujah. Jesus. It's time for us to do just that. To rise up. It's time for us to rise up. Where there is life, there is hope. Where you are, there is a thought. 
It is. It is. Everybody in this room, when you walk forward and you step up on the scene, that rise means something to you. I can go to downtown Columbus and walk around and say, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. I can say to everybody, I'm not even a normal, I might help somebody that day. But when I say to a crowd of apostolic people, of Holy Ghost filled people, blood bought, redeemed multitude of my church, when I tell you to rise, up. When you come up, there is a level of authority that comes when you get up and take action. There's an authority that no one else on the face of the earth has. There's a power that no other group of people has on the face of the planet. But there's a power in this room. It's a power that's come only from him. That do this. It's that, and we shall receive power after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon. Alright. It's the power that you got at your Acts 238 experience. It's that Holy Ghost fire burning on the inside. Right. Mm. It's that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. It's swelling in your mortal body and it's quickening your spirit. So when you rise up, you rise up with all authority and power of the one that healed the blind. All you right. got the authority and the power of the one that touched the man with the withered hand. All right. You got the same power that Peter had when he told the man at the gate called beautiful to kill him. You have that same power, that same position. Oh, hallelujah. 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 